Welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. My name is John Dinsey, and I am glad to be with you during this hour. We have a wonderful Bible study for you. We're studying lesson number 10, Satan's Final Deception, the quarterly, Three Cosmic Messages. It's an exciting study, a study needed for this time. We're studying about the three angels' messages of uh, Revelation chapter 14. So we hope you have your Bible and you're ready to start this uh, lesson study. If you don't have one, you can go to 3 abn sabbathschoolpanelcom You can download one for free. I'd like to introduce first uh, to my left, Pastor Daniel Perrin. Welcome. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I have Monday's lesson, The Old Lie of Immortality. Oh, a good lesson. We also have uh, J Pastor James Rafferty here. Tell us what you have. Well, good to be here, Johnny. I have uh, Tuesday's lesson, which is entitled Babylon, the Center of Sun Worship. Oh, another wonderful lesson. Pastor John Lomacang, tell us what you have. Mine is Wednesday, a call to faithfulness. And I'm looking forward to it because I know Pastor Mark put some good content in here. Amen, amen. Sister Shelley Quinn, welcome. Oh, I'm so privileged to sit here with you. We learn so much from each other, actually, as we do these deep studies. I have Thursday, grace for obedience, and there's no other way you can obey. Amen, amen. Please uh, lead us into the prayer, please. Oh, absolutely. Abba, Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, thanking you, Lord, for all you've done to save humanity, for all you continue to do. How we thank you for revelation and specifically, Lord, for your precious messages found in the three angels, message and warning to us. Oh, Lord, send your Holy Spirit now. Speak through us. Let him be the teacher. Mm -hmm. We give you all the praise and honor and glory. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, we begin our study with the portion in Saturday and Sunday. And uh, the memory text is from John chapter 17, verse 17. The Bible says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. For this week's study, we are going to look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 and 14, also 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 4 verse 16 and 17, and Ezekiel 8, 16, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 1 through 20, and Revelation chapter 18, verse 4 and 5. And I'd like to start by reading Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. And it says there, this is the second angel's message. It says, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This lesson is important because we are living very close to the times when all of the things you see mentioned there in Revelation, Revelation chapter 14, beginning in verse 6, it has already begun, as you have already heard in the previous lesson. Uh, the first angel's message about the hour of his judgment has come. That has already begun. Let's go ahead and see what the lesson tells us concerning uh, the things that are going on in the world. As we have seen, Revelation warns us that the inhabitants of the earth will drink a deadly potion called the wine of Babylon. There are false doctrines and teachings that in the end will lead only to death. However, the world is not left without an antidote. The protection against the spiritual poison is the three angels' messages. Well put by Pastor Mark Finley. Uh, notice that the verse said that all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of fornication of Babylon. This means the whole world is impacted. Likewise, the three angels' messages is supposed to go to all the world because the devil has done a work all around the world. The three angels' messages have to go all around the world. And please consider, uh, I'm sure you've been driving down the road and you see those orange signs that are warning signs. And there are some signs that don't really tell you what's ahead. I've seen signs that say, that say danger ahead. Have you seen that sign? I'm sure. Yes. Danger ahead. This means that you have to be alert and be careful, even slow down, because the danger ahead may be at risk of your life. You may risk your life if you continue going fast, if you continue being careless. 
the same thing we want to tell you as you look at the three angels' messages. This is danger ahead. So please pay close attention as we continue this study. In this week's lesson, we will continue looking not only at Babylon's deception about Jesus, the plans of Jesus to save us from, the, from them and the death that they would all the otherwise bring. Sunday's portion of the lesson is the way that seems right in a man's eyes. You know, it's interesting that as you look at the world, I've been around for a few years and I can tell you that some things that in the past was considered, considered unacceptable now seems to be acceptable. You can, uh, by taking a look at television, you can see the history of television. There was a time, I don't know if it was the 50s or 60s, you were not even allowed to show a belly button, but today the things have gone way out of control. And words on the, on the, on the regular home television sets that are coming out uh, before it was banned, but now they seem to be approved. And so we are living in dangerous times. Society now calls evil good and good evil. Right seems to be wrong and wrong seems to be right. And so we are living in dangerous times and we need to be aware of these things and uh, take heed because we can be carried away by the wine of Babylon. We can be ca carried away by the confusion and immorality that is taking place that now seems to be acceptable. So let's go ahead and go to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 31. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 31, uh, the Bible tells us, a, a, gives us a message that we need to heed. Matthew chapter 24, verse 31, uh, this is what the Bible tells us. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This is a message that is vitally important to understand. Jesus will gather his elect. And when you go to Matthew 13, the lesson brings this out. It says, in the context of the last days, Jesus uttered a powerful warning for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So the elect have to be uh, aware, they have to be sober because you will also uh, be uh, tempted in a way that to lead you astray. But the elect are not led astray. If it were possible to deceive the elect, they are not deceived because their trust is in Jesus. They are studying God's word. They are staying close to the Lord and they will be prepared. The deceptions in the last days will increase. If you think you're seeing deceptions now, greater deceptions will come. People are claiming to be Jesus. There are false prophets on, out there unlike any other time of earth's history. And their impact seems to be greater now because before you can have a person that claims to be a false Christ or a false prophet speak to a few people and it would, it would just stay in that local area. Today, these people can get on the internet and they can reach hundreds, thousands, and maybe millions of people with false messages. And so we need to be careful. We need to study God's word because God's word shows us the way, the truth, and the life. Revelation chapter 12, verse nine, the Bible tells us, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Satan has capacity to deceive. He has been practicing for several thousand years and we need to take heed. We need to study God's word so that we are uh, ready and we are prepared and we will be able to, by God's grace, discern false doctrines and discern the deception that he brings to us. Uh, Mark Finley says in the lesson, Obviously, God is going to have some faithful people in the last days as he, as he has had through the ages. However, the wording here shows just how widespread Satan's deception really is. If it were possible, he would try to deceive the very elect. Please join me in 1 Corinthians chapter, thir uh, chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse uh, 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This is what the Bible tells us. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. This is a warning for us. Let him who thinks he stands take heed 
lest you fall. If you think, I've got it all together, I know all the doctrines, I know my Bible, I am not going to be deceived. We need to be connected to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will guide us. Continuing on in verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. We can thank God that He is ready to give us the help we need when we need it. Revelation, uh, Proverbs uh, 14, verse 12. Proverbs 14, 12, there's a message for us. Notice, and this is really the title for this uh, Sunday's lesson. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And so uh, the times are going to be so dangerous that we are going to see fulfillment of things that Jesus has mentioned. Uh, Matthew chapter 24. You can look at Luke chapter 23 and other places in the Bible. Daniel, Revelation. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 is a scripture that we bring to your attention. The heart is deceitful above all things. What? The heart is deceitful above all things? You have a heart and so you need to be careful because the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And this is why we should not depend on ourselves. We need to depend on Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So, uh, we need to stay close to the Lord. The Lord is our strength. The Lord is our guide, our counselor, and the Holy Scriptures are a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. Isaiah 5, 13. Therefore, my people have gone into captivity. Why? Because they have no knowledge. Why do they go into captivity? Because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. So, there's knowledge in the Holy Scriptures. And if we take time to study, prayerfully study God's Word, we will be protected from the deceptions that are already all over the place. Every wind of doctrine is blowing. We need to, as the Bereans, go to the Bible and see for a thus saith the Lord. Yes. So are you studying the Bible daily? Are you taking time to study, to uh, put yourself in the hands of the Lord so that when deceptions come, you have the protection of Jesus. He is a strong tower and our refuge and strength in time of need. And this is a time of need. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pastor Dinsey. I'm Daniel Perrin and I'm sharing Monday's lesson, which is the old lie of immortality. And maybe you've heard the phrase, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Mm -hmm. That certainly applies to this lesson. And I want to share a statistic with you that uh, maybe you've heard, and it is this. 10 out of 10 people die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and virtually nobody likes it. Maybe there are a few here and there. But there is good news in God's word about death. And there are people who don't know that there's good news about death as they approach it or as it's a, a part of their family. They don't know what comes next and they really have no hope at all. But the trouble is that wherever there is good news, there is an old lie and an old liar hanging around to trip you up. So the good news is this. God alone has life, eternal life, in Himself. We don't have it. And He gives that life to those who receive Him. Those who die, they rest in the ground, they rest in the grave, and they wait until the resurrection when Jesus shall give them that life. And so this truth keeps us connected to God because He's the source of our life. The lie is this. You have life in your own self that cannot be taken away from you. Now, along with this lie come several other lies, which I'll get to in a minute. But this lie disconnects you from God because you have life in yourself. You don't need it from another source. And this lie comes from all sides and for good reason. We want to beat death. We're susceptible to this. And you find it in modern culture. 
TV sitcoms. You'll see it, uh, people referencing spirits coming back, reality shows, documentary shows about ghost hunters or haunted houses. You can look through so many movies, and you shouldn't. The entire Star Wars franchise, filled with spirits from the dead, Lord of the Rings, lesser known movies, actors who talk about channeling spirits to give them their power, to give them knowledge and the ability to harness the, the power of looking like and acting like someone. Cartoons for children, Casper the Friendly Ghost, The Lion King, Disney movies, Disney parks. There are ghost Legos, ghost dolls. There are toys designed like Ouija boards and others. Books for children, whole series of them. Harry Potter, the immensely popular Goosebumps series, and then you take a uh, perfectly innocuous seeming children's book and all of a sudden in comes a witch or spiritualism. Video games, even the old classic Pac-Man, who is he chased by? Ghosts. Spirits from the dead, not a big deal you say, but subtly into our minds are drifting these concepts. Halloween, not so subtle, $10.6 billion spent in this country, United States, last year on Halloween. And then classical culture. Shakespeare, full of spirits from the dead. Kids gotta read the classics, we say. No, kids gotta know the truth. You take Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, one example out of many, and I don't need to go much farther except to say that it doesn't matter how far you go back and what we read, what we write, we see this stuff. Music, a well-loved song, Ave Maria. It's a prayer to a dead person. We hear it in jokes. Somebody dies and they arrive at the gate and St. Peter is there to let them in. Christian books, lots of them telling stories, an immensely popular story called The Shack a few years ago, redefining what God is like. And this book then brings back spirits from the dead to give messages from beyond the grave. And that famous Christian prayer, now I lay myself down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I'm just trying to say the enemy is doing everything possible to turn you away from where life really comes from. In Revelation 16, 13 and 14, I'll take you there. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them for battle of that great day of God Almighty. And we know where we know there is and will be demonic deceptions. And those deceptions come with power and lies and signs and cunning, believable, desirable, powerful, not grotesque, because that would turn people away, but things that make you feel good. Satan does not have the power to create life, but he can imitate it. And we see that back in Exodus 7 when the plagues began. And what did the Egyptian magicians do by the power of Satan? They imitated, they counterfeited the power of God with their enchantments. All right, and this enchantments are believed by those. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10 it says, according to the working of Satan with all power signs and lying wonders, all in righteous deception by those, received by those who did not love the truth. What is the truth? All right, quick run through. John 5, 26, the father has life in himself, grants it to the son to have life in himself. First, 2 Timothy 1, 10, the, our savior, Jesus Christ, abolishes death and brought life and immortality. We don't have it in ourselves. Revelation 2, 7, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat of the tree of life. It's not naturally yours. First Corinthians 15, 53 and 54, this corruption must put on incorruption and the mortal put on immortality. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and we could go through every book of the Bible almost, for the living know that they will die, the dead know nothing. What's the result if I accept this lie that I have natural immortality? Number one, if, if so, then sin does not bring death. And that's what God promised in Genesis 2, 7. That's what Paul says in Romans 6, 23, wages of sin are death. Sin doesn't bring death if I don't die. If, uh, if I accept the idea that the soul is immortal, then Jesus does not have the power to overcome sin and death. And there is dualism, some uh, powers that are equally powerful in God just could not destroy sin and death. 
uh, if I accept the immortal soul, then the Bible's teaching on a future judgment in the second coming are not true. That he appointed a day when he will judge in the future. That judgment doesn't happen the day I die. It happens in the future. And the second coming, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18, the Lord comes with uh, a shout from heaven, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ rise first, and then we who are alive uh, and remain rise up with them, meet them in the air, and thus, or in this way, we shall be with the Lord, not in any other way other than when he comes. Um, if I accept that there is an eternal soul, then throughout all eternity, God is going to be a cosmic torturer. I'm enjoying eternal life over here, while over there, he for the rest of all eternity is grotesquely torturing people. And they're formidable atheists. Take Robert Ingersoll, for instance, who traces his atheism to this idea right here. And he was right. Who wants a God who is going to torture for all time? Because uh, the Christian church doesn't want to talk about hell because uh, it, it's disgusting, an eternal torture, and so they turn it into a metaphor. You'll just have a bad life, or they ignore it and say there's no judgment, or they, they lean into a universal salvation, that God will save everybody regardless of who you are because nobody wants to believe this. And if we accept an eternal soul doctrine, then we open the door for communication from demonic spirits because, and all in the name of respecting loved ones, we, we then open ourselves up to to say that they can come back from the dead. And if there's somebody coming back from the dead to give us a message, it's not gonna be from God. It might sound okay because is the devil gonna come giving outright lies? He certainly could, but he blends it. He mixes it in with the truths of Christianity, the truths of God's word. God promises to give us the Holy Spirit, but the enemy can certainly send an unholy spirit just because a, a, a thought enters our mind or because we see something with our eyes, if it does not go along with God's word uh, exactly as God gives it to us, then we need to close the door against it. And finally here, if we accept an immortal soul doctrine, then heaven is simply a place where there are disembodied spirits floating around and that has gone a long way to discourage for people from even wanting to spend an eternity in God's presence. Listen to what Job says, chapter 19, verse 26 and 27. After my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh, I will see God. And so Jesus, sorry, in my flesh, I will see God uh, and I will behold him my eyes and not another. All right. So we go physically as a body, as a person in heaven. Uh, I come now to Jesus in John 11, verse 24 to 26. His friend Lazarus has died and he told his disciples, uh, Lazarus is sleeping. They say, well, then he'll wake up. He says, no, he has died. And so he goes down to uh, Jerusalem. Martha says to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Okay. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Because all life comes through belief, through faith in Jesus, through his word. It doesn't come because of ourselves. We don't have it on our own. It comes through Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, we still have the study Babylon, the center of sun worship, a call to faithfulness and grace for obedience. And we will continue this study in a moment. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Thank you. We are back and we are ready to continue this study with Pastor James Rafferty. I have Tuesday's lesson. It is entitled Babylon, the Center of Sun Worship. And we're going to be looking at a text in the Old Testament, uh, book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 16. I don't know if you realize this, but we've been talking about the first angel's message, which calls us to worship God and points us, directs us to the creation week and also to the commandments and specifically highlights the seventh day Sabbath or Saturday. 
But a lot of people don't realize that sun worship or Sunday worship is not a new phenomena. It's as old as the Bible. In other words, you can go back into the Word of God, back to God's people in ancient times, and you can find this conflict between worshiping God on the Sabbath and worshiping the sun is present. And we're going to see that in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 16 Ezekiel is brought in to the inner court of the Lord's house. He's in vision now and God is showing him things concerning the apostasy of God's people. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about five and 20 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east and they worship the sun toward the east. So what we have here is we have God's people, God's covenant people, God's called people turning their back on the temple, turning their back on the worship of God, turning their back on the Sabbath and worshiping the sun toward the east. Now, when we look at this, we realize, and this is what the quarterly brings out, sun worship was prominent in Egypt, in Assyria, in Persia, and certainly in Babylon. In his book, The Worship of Nature by James G. Frazier, he makes this observation that in ancient Babylon, the sun was worshiped from immoral, uh, immoral antiquity. For, and that's volume one, page 529. So it may seem surprising, the quarterly goes on to say, but at, the t at times, Babylonian sun worship influenced the worship of God's people in the Old Testament. Hmm. Did you know that? In other words, God's people were in apostasy, apostasy, rejecting the commandments of God, rejecting the faithfulness of God before they were taken into Babylonian captivity. And you might even say that God brought them into Babylonian captivity because not only of their apostasy, but because of the need that God had to bring the light of the truth of the gospel to the Babylonians. God's people had failed to do this. You might say, well, if they failed to do this, why do you take them into captivity? Because during that captivity, there were those who were awakened to their need of having a relationship with God, like Daniel, Azariah, Mishael, and uh, Hananiah. And they were committed themselves to the Lord as Daniel did. They purposed to serve God with all the heart and God used them as evangelists. All of them became evangelists and they began to share the messages of, we could call it the three angels' messages in a sense. They began to share the message of the everlasting gospel with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the epitome of Babylon. We were talking about the principles of Babylon, not only the sun worship, but the intoxication. You know, Nebuchadnezzar was the first person to, to act as though God hadn't revealed things to him, to act matter intoxicated. And God said, okay, you're going to act that way. I'm going to let you be that way. And for seven years, Nebuchadnezzar was like a madman. He was out there you know, eating grass and acting like a wild animal. His kingdom was taken from him for seven years. God allows us to reap the consequences of, of those things that we choose to believe or to do. And that's what we see here in the context of the three angels' messages. But going back here, so you go to history past. This is before the Christian church. You have the church of the Hebrews, the church of the Israelites, and they compromised their faith and began to worship the sun and turn they're back on the Lord. Then God brings a revival. Jesus Christ, Messiah comes. The Holy Spirit is poured out. Christ is sacrificed for our sins. The early church with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit goes forth to proclaim the gospel. But as the centuries pass, guess what? Satan comes in with his same deceptions. That, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about Satan's final deceptions. And he decides, you know, I was able to do it one time before. I think I can do it again. And so he begins to bring this sun worship back into the Christian church. How does he do it? Well, here's what the quarterly uh, goes on to say. Uh, in er the early part of the fourth century, the Roman Emperor Constantine mm -hmm. became a Christian. Oh, people were so happy. They were so excited. Constantine, this pagan Roman emperor, is becoming a Christian. And as he becomes a Christian, he has a strong affinity that he brings with him for sun worship. And so what he decides to do is he decides to bring sun worship into his new Christian faith. His whole army is baptized through the river and sun, be, uh, sun worship becomes a day venerated by the Christian faith. It's talked about here in the history and decline of the fall of the, and the fall of the Roman Empire um, by uh, uh, Edward, Gibb, 
Edward Gibbons. He says, the sun was universally celebrated as the invincible guide and the protector of Constantine. Constantine also passed the first Sunday law. This edict stated on the venerable day of the sun, let magistrates and the people residing in the cities rest, let all workshops be closed. That was the edict of Constantine, AD 321. So when we look at what took place in Israel with the Hebrews, with the apostasy and the turning away from God, it's not surprising as successful as that was that we see a repeat of that taking place in the Christian church. Satan did in the, has done, is doing in the New Testament what he did in the Old Testament. He's doing now what he did with his people of old. Ezekiel chapter eight, and there are other verses that we didn't read, but I'll just give you the references so you can study them. Second Kings chapter 23 verses five and 11 tell us that God's people apostatized and they started worshiping the sun. They started following the sun worship of the pagans around them, of those who were worshiping other deities around them. And then we find the same thing taking place in the New Testament era. God's people eventually apostatized. Paul talked about this in 2 Corinthians chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. There would be an apostasy, a falling away from the faith and that transition would take place to this man of sin. Constantine began that transition. He became a Christian, uh, baptized his army mm -hmm. and brought in this sun worship in a way that venerated what he had always practiced as a pagan, but made it Christian. Now, a lot of people don't know that. They think, oh, well, I worship on Sunday because that's the day Jesus rose from the grave. I worship on Sunday because, you know, that's the day the apostles met to, together and broke bread. By the way, they broke bread on every day of the week and not right. just on Sunday. Oh, I worship on Sunday because it's a tradition. I worship on Sunday because that's what our church does. They don't realize that, that sun worship goes all the way back to pagan religion and not to biblical religion. So we've been looking at this message, this everlasting gospel message, and the last call to that message is to worship Him. And we can see the reason why that call is made is because we've forgotten what God told us to remember. What God wanted us to remember was the seventh day. Why? Well, the Sabbath was instituted in Eden. It's a reminder of all that God has done for us without us. Like the gospel, the Sabbath teaches us to cease from our works and rest in God's works. It's a sign of Christ's perfect work for uh, a freedom from slavery for us. It's a sign of God's power of sanctification, of his power of salvation, of his power of eternal redemption. Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 12 and Isaiah 66, 23 and Deuteronomy 5, 15. The Sabbath points to God's recreative power, reminding us that, that God spoke worlds into existence and he can speak you into you a new creation. It's the creative power of God to recreate us a new heart, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and Psalm 51 verse 10. On the other hand, Babylon teaches that God, well, that God did not create the world in six literal days. It embraces a form of evolution, therefore casts doubt upon the power of God and the Sabbath as a memorial of that power. Here's a summary of what Babel, Babylon teaches regarding creation. U.S. News and World Report, November 4, 1996. Did God create mankind in, the, in His image, as the Bible says, or did humans evolve from animals? as Darwin theorized nearly 150 years ago. According to John Paul II, evolution may be a better explanation. In his message to a meeting of the Academy of Sciences, which was, has, has taken the origin of life as its theme, the statement of John Paul reflects the church's acceptance of evolution. Mm -hmm. The statement is unlikely to influence Catholic schools where evolution has been taught since the 1950s. Indeed, reading the entire Bible literally has not been a dominant practice among Catholics through much of the 20th century, and that was Time Magazine, November 4, 1996. So two magazines reporting on the teaching of this church, basically saying they've embraced evolution. And what can you expect? Because the Sabbath is not only a sign of God's power to, 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 to save us, to sanctify us, to redeem us, it's also a, a sign of His creation power, that He is the Creator. And if you reject the Sabbath, you create, reject the Creator, and of course you're going to embrace evolution. I mean, the Bible says that God spoke and it was done. He commanded, it stood fast. Psalm 33, verse 9. Part of the wine of Babylon is the idea that we evolved, which suggests that we are naturally becoming a better species. If we believe the theory of evolution, we don't really need a savior, we just need time. Time in purgatory, time to do penance. We just need time and we can save ourselves. The human race is evolving, we're getting better. Salvation from sin is just a matter of time, not faith in a savior. Thus, evolution and the basic teaching of Babylon go hand in hand. Friends, don't drink the wine of Babylon. Come out of her, my people. 
Amen. Thank you, James. Wow. This lesson is concentrated, and we're going to continue on that very vein because you might hear a passion in all of our speakers and presenters because this is a vitally, it's a life-saving message. It's not a, it's not a doctrine that the Adventist Church embraces uh, in lieu of all the other teachings of the Bible. It's a message that God wants the world to know. He wants the people of the world to know whether you are religious or not, whether you are Christian or secular, whatever the category, everyone is going to stand in judgment one day before God. Why stand in judgment unprepared when an opportunity for salvation and a way out of this city of confusion, this fallen system of Babylon is being offered by God's word? And so many Christians are told not to read Revelation. Well, if I were the devil, I'll say the same thing. Don't read Revelation because you'll find out what I'm doing to you. Revelation reveals the massive depth and layers of deception that has gripped the Christian world today. Revelation reveals the dark, sinister side of Satan's system of falsehoods, mm -hmm. of deception, of lies, lies. Three unclean spirits out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet, the dragon, spiritualism, the beast, Catholicism, the false prophet, apostate Protestantism. Those who at the beginning claimed to be holding to the Bible and the Bible only. When Martin Luther began the Protestant Reformation, it was a call back to the Word of God, but it was not fully restored. There were other teachings, Calvin, Zwingli, Huss, Jerome, Wycliffe, and the list goes on and on. When the American Bible Society was established, all the true doctrines had not yet been fully restored. When the Adventist Church began in 1863, coming out of the 1844 misunderstanding of the second coming of Christ by William Miller, the truth of all these doctrines had not yet been fully restored. But we're living in a day and age where they have been fully restored. And yet there are those who have stopped somewhere along the way and say, I want to, I want to maintain this darkness that was taught 1,500 years ago or 1,800 years ago or 500 years ago, like in 1920s when this whole ideology of speaking in tongues was, was infiltrated into America. Mm -hmm. There are those today that now, instead of saying the Holy Spirit's evidence is the fruit of the Spirit, mm -hmm. they say it's the gift of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. The Lord never said by their gifts you'll know them, only by their fruits you'll know them. And now they make tongues a test of faith. And tongues is not a test of faith. Your evidence is love, joy, mm -hmm. peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, patience. And furthermore, you don't get a gift that you prefer. The Holy Spirit gives the gift to whomsoever he desires. Why give you the gift of tongues when James and I can speak English? Why would I need to speak to him in something that's in, unintelligible? That's right. Doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So Christian churches today, that's called glossolalia out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. What comes out? Deception. So you get a church wrapped in confusion, and God is not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. So what's happening today? Babylon is fallen. That's why this lesson is entitled, A Call to Faithfulness. Now, where can we find our defense? Psalms 91 and verse 4. He shall cover you with his feathers, mm -hmm. and under his wings you shall take refuge. Don't miss this. His truth shall be your shield and buckler or your shield and defense. Mm -hmm. Today, we are def the Christian church is defenseless on a large degree because they have not accepted truth. They have fought against truth. Mm -hmm. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Preachers say forget. Preachers say we have a different day. Mm -hmm. Preachers say it was just for the Jews. Lies, lies, and more lies. It's scriptural. It's established by God. Watch this. Solomon says, remember the creator in the days of your youth. Every pastor says, young people need to know the Lord. Dr. Luke says, remember Lot's wife. Not a pastor on the planet will argue with that. But God says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And the devil plugs in his demonic pastors who say, don't do what God says. Follow Solomon, follow Dr. Luke, but don't you dare follow God's remember. Who do you think is behind that? Nobody but the sinister enemy that is against the truth of God. What has happened to the church? Isaiah 4, verse 1. And in that day, seven women, seven churches, shall take hold of one man, the man Christ Jesus, mm -hmm. saying, watch, this is what happened. We will eat our own bread, the bread of life. Man shall not live by bread alone. We'll eat our own bread. We will wear our own apparel. We have our own standard of righteousness. Mm -hmm. Only thing we want from you, only let us be called by your name, to take away our reproach. Mm -hmm. So today, Christianity is, to a large degree, just a name. Mm -hmm. But for it to be more than that, it has to be based on God's word. Mm -hmm. How did something that God established to be so true get so distorted? 
Paul the Apostle gives us some answers. Romans 16, verse 18. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And watch this. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Mm. There are people today that are looking to, to clergy for answers, but they're not getting answers. What are they getting? Smooth words, mm -hmm. because these men live for their own belly. Flattering speech. Your ship is coming in. Mm. God is going to give you all the blessings you need. Friends, don't you realize that sometimes blessings eclipse God's presence? Because if all people want from God is just this divine Santa Claus, that just bless, 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 give me, give me, give me, they'll never understand the need for prayer. Mm. You don't find that in the Bible. You don't find God pouring things into the lives of his followers. He talked to them about denial. If anyone would come after me, let him, let him deny himself. But God is now seen as the, the, you don't have what you don't have because you don't ask. You don't have because you don't have enough faith. And today, that call to faithfulness, to the word of God, to the very thing that Jesus used in the garden, thus saith the Lord, is not proclaimed any longer. Thus saith uh, this preacher or that preacher. Tie it back to God's word. If the word of God was used by Jesus against Satan himself, why today do Christian leaders not use God's word to, to defend themselves against the darkness that prevails? Mm -hmm. But what do they do instead? The devil has done a great job. Notice what he's done. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13 to 15. Here's why there's so much confusion. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder or no surprise, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also appear or transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. You might say, wait a minute, they can't be deceptive. They look the part. No, the Lord says, don't look at what they look at. Listen to what they say. Mm -hmm. If they speak not according to this word, Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. First mm -hmm. John 2 verse 3 and 4. He who says, I know him. Let me just start with verse three. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Verse four, he who saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Why don't Christians desire to be safe? Don't take the word of men. Don't even take our word. Search the scriptures for yourselves. We keep the Sabbath because God says so, not because it's a tenant of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's the tenant of the Lord himself established at the mouth and the end of creation. Mm -hmm. Why would Jesus say, sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth in John 17, 17, if truth didn't matter? Mm -hmm. Pilate says, what is truth? So many Christians today take the word of Pilate over the word of Jesus. What is truth? Mm -hmm. The Agrippas, Paul, you almost persuaded me. I'll call you at a convenient time as, as um, was said to Paul, there's no convenient time. The best time is right now. And so you find today, as James was saying, there's an established sign. God is looking for the sign. If the Lord came to the earth today, could he find the sign in you? He says in Exodus 20 and verse 20, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Now let's follow that a moment. Christian churches today, and Shelley, you know this, they teach pretty much just justification. That's it. Once saved, always saved. Why don't they get the Sabbath message? Because they don't teach mm -hmm. sanctification. Mm -hmm. The Sabbath is a sign of sanctification. It is evidence that you know the Lord is sanctifying you. But the reason you never get that is because once saved, always saved is just the message of justification. Mm -hmm. I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm going to heaven no matter what. Mm -hmm. That's not scriptural. That's why uh, when... Um, when Ahab was going after Elijah and he was trying to condemn Elijah for stirring up the, the corrupt minds of those who had departed from God, Elijah had to say to him clearly, don't blame me. First Kings 18, 18, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have in that. And this is not even new. This is old hat mm -hmm. in that you and your fathers have forsaken the commandments of God and have followed the Baals. Friends today, Baal worship 
is alive and well. Mm -hmm. That's why the only way to be distinguished from worshiping the false gods, the false days, the false doctrines is in Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You can be faithful if you simply follow God and his word. Oh, amen. amen. Thank you all so much. I've enjoyed each one of your lessons. My name is Shelley Quinn, and I will be speaking about my favorite topic, grace. Mm -hmm. uh, Thursday's lesson is grace for obedience. And so hold on, because first what I want to do is kind of encapsulate or assimilate everything they've said. You know, we started <laughs> off this quarterly with eight <laughs> programs on righteousness by faith and the first angel's message. Now we're into a heavy warning on the second angel's message who's saying Babylon has fallen. Babylon the Great is a system of apostates that have become united. We know it's the papal system. It is apostate Protestantism and spiritualism. Mm -hmm. And you know, what people don't realize is that when Christian churches began keeping Sunday, what we actually did is create a bond with the Roman papacy mm -hmm. because the Catholic Church readily admits, hey, we changed the Sabbath to Sunday, and they'll say, there's not a single scripture in the Bible. And you Protestants, they laugh at Protestants who keep Sunday because they said, hey, you're actually, it's like you're a little child running away with a picture of your mother close to your heart. So what we've got to realize is that they're passing around. We see in Revelation, this woman dressed in scarlet and purple, and she's riding on the scarlet covered beast. And she's got this wine, this false doctrine mm -hmm. of a Sunday sacredness in place of God's seventh day Sabbath. She's got the immortality of the soul, which guess what? That lays a foundation for spiritualism. Mm -hmm. As you said, 1 Timothy 6, 16 makes it clear. God lives in unapproachable light. He alone is immortal, but he will gift his children with immortality. 1 Corinthians 15, 53 and 54 says at that last trumpet. Hallelujah. That's right. So what we're seeing, and I think James, you're the one that touched on this more than anyone, is that the, the, I think to me, the worst apostasy is the teaching that we can save ourselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that we can somehow earn salvation by works. Mm -hmm. That flies completely in the face of the everlasting covenant of God. Righteousness by faith is the only answer. And if you think, I don't care what church you go to, you may be a wonderful Seventh-day Adventist who thinks that you, because you're a vegan, because you dress in a certain way, because you keep your face scrubbed and no makeup on, you think you're earning your salvation. I actually met somebody who said, I'm ready to be translated. I'm a vegan. I tithe. I go to church and keep the Sabbath. And it's like never mentioning Jesus Christ. So I just want to make sure you understand that when we're talking about Babylon, we're talking about an apostate religious system and the religious leaders. God has a faithful people in every church. Please don't think we're not bashing anybody in any other Protestant denomination or in the Catholic church. God has a faithful people and he makes an appeal to these multitudes who are still in the fallen organizations. And Listen to his heart. You know, he says in Ezekiel 33, 11, oh, I, he didn't want anyone to die. 
He says, turn, turn from your wicked way. Why should you die? And Revelation 18 verses four and five, he sends another message. Here's what John says. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, come out of Babylon, lest you share in her sins, lest you receive her plagues for her sins have reached to heaven hmm. and God has remembered her iniquities. The Bible defines sin in 1 John 3, 4. It says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness for sin is lawlessness. It's to ignore God's law. It's to transgress or break God's law. First John 2, 4, as you said, says anyone who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. Mm. If you say I know Jesus, he's my savior, but you're not keeping his commandments. The apostle John says you are a liar and the truth is not in you. First John 2, 4. Romans 14, 23 adds an element to, to the definition of sin. Whatever does not originate and proceed from faith is sin. We've got to have a faith. It's in the word of God. Yeah. And we've got to have a conviction that God has approved it or it's sinful. God's everlasting covenant of righteousness by faith. Two aspects. The first is Jesus life and death. When he died as a substitute on the cross for us, he justified us. If you accept Christ as your savior, you are accepting that he paid your penalty for sin. That's to be justified, to be declared innocent, that you're acquitted because his righteousness is credited to you. But the second aspect of righteousness by faith is sanctification. God's not just going to deliver us from the penalty of sin. He came to destroy the works of the devil. He is going to deliver us from the power of sin. Right. And he, you know, uh, Psalm 85, 10 says that mercy and truth met together, that righteousness and peace kissed. This happened at the cross. And it goes on in verse 13 of Psalm 85. It says righteousness goes before him and makes his footsteps a pathway. So here's the deal. We are saved by grace through faith. Do you know what grace is? The unearned, undeserved gifts of God. Do you know what the three greatest gifts of grace are? You've got to understand the gifts of grace to understand the effects of grace. Jesus Christ is the greatest gift of grace that God ever gave to the world. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only begotten covenant son. Then we've got the Holy Spirit, the, the from power from on high. That's the second greatest gift of grace, grace and the word. So let's look. The word gives us grace for obedience. We've got to have faith in God's word. Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. And in Romans 12, 2, Paul says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How is your mind going to be renewed so that as he puts it, you can prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God right here in the word. That's why Jesus said in John 17, 17, mm -hmm. sanctify them, set them apart from evil by your, your truth. Your word is truth. Okay. The Holy Spirit gives us grace for obedience. He's given to all who accept Christ as their Savior. He teaches us. He empowers us. The Bible tells us in Philippians 2.13 that God works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. So how is God working in us? Oh, I love what Paul said in Ephesians 3, 16. He's praying and he says, oh, I pray that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might, with dynamite, dunamis power 
through his spirit in your inner man. And then it goes on and he says, that's so that Christ can dwell in your heart through faith. See, when the Holy Spirit is in you, Christ is dwelling in your heart through faith. Then you understand the love of God. And Jesus is grace for obedience. He came to save us from our sins. I've got to say this, Hebrews 7, 22, he is the surety of the covenant. He's a surety from God to us. He guarantees from God to us because 2 Corinthians 1, 20 says all of God's promises are yes and amen in Christ. And we've already looked at Philippians 2, 13. He's the surety from us to God that he's going to work in us to will and to do his good pleasure. You can only obey by grace. Amen. 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 What a blessing it has been to hear each and every one of you. And we'd like to give you each a moment to give a final thought for our brothers and sisters here. Yes. Well, every lie has to be exposed, no matter how slight, no matter how insignificant it might seem, because heaven is all truth. God is all truth. And God loves you enough. God loves me enough each of us enough to say, I'm going to send these messages through angels, through people to expose what is not true and lead you to the truth. Amen. Satan's final deceptions are the same as they always have been. You know, he is the center of any kind of worship that is outside the word of God. Our only safety, Revelation 14 and verse 4. Follow the lamb wherever he goes. Amen. That's right. And the Bible makes it clear in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 11. There will be those who will receive strong delusion, not because God wants to delude them, but because they do not receive a love of the truth that they might be saved. It's not enough to even know the truth. We have to fall in love with Christ and his truth to be shielded from deception. Ephesians 2 8 tells us that we are saved by grace through faith. I want to encourage you. If you're in a church that's not following the word or if you're not sure, you've got to get into the word for yourself to find out. But step out in faith. God, by his grace, by the power of Jesus Christ living in you, by the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, and by the word of God, you can walk in obedience and please God. Amen. Amen. Well, we thank uh, Sister Shelley Quinn, Pastor John Lomacan, Pastor James Rafferty, and Pastor Daniel Perrin. And we want to thank you for joining us. I would like to leave you with the words of Jesus found in John chapter 16. And it says in verse 1 and 2, These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. This is going to happen again. So I encourage you to stay close to the Lord. Follow him with all of your heart. Next lesson is number 11, the seal of God and the mark of the beast, part one. We'll see you then. <laughs>